Welcome to the Land Geek Podcast, your resource for information and tips to making money by buying and selling land. Let the Land Geek show you how to make a passive income by working smart, not working hard. Learn strategies and tricks to make money buying and selling raw land today. And here is the man that's going to help you do that, the Land Geek. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, from your favorite land investing real estate site. It's an itchy, but you love it. I know you love it. www.thelandgeek.com. All right, this is going to be an unbelievably informative podcast today. And I'm really excited about it because I like to do this every now and again. Bring in a newbie coaching client, coaching student. So somebody who went from very little land investing knowledge to doing their first few deals in only a short 90 days. I wanted to get uh, this student's perspective from you know when he started to where he is now and talk about his process. And I think it'd be really helpful for those of you who might be on the fence, like is this something that uh, I can do? And does this thing really work? And for those of you who are actually doing it, this will help motivate you and get you to send out those offers. So I am pleased and privileged to rope in coaching student, big dog, Jonathan Kennedy from Florida. Jonathan, how are you? Hey, Mark. I'm doing great. Thanks for the introduction. How are you doing? Uh, pulse is still normal. Respiration is still fine. I can't complain. All right, let's talk about you. Uh, what's your background? Where are you from originally? Well, originally I was born in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and I moved to the States when I was about 12. I uh, went to school down in Florida and then moved up to Washington, D.C. about six years ago. Uh, went to grad school there, worked for a couple of years, started grad school again, stopped grad school, moved back to Florida, and here I am working in the land business. Nice, nice. So what really drew you to the land business as opposed to flipping houses, doing some other type of real estate niche? Well, I actually moved down to Florida originally to start a wholesaling business with my brother. And he had been working in real estate Wholesaling houses, yeah. And he had been working in real estate down here for a couple of years. He had been pretty successful, uh, so the idea sounded appealing to me. It was better than another four years of school making no money. Uh, so I decided to come down here and join him. And sort of coincidentally, the first deal that we, you know, was really a solid lead uh, ended up being a piece of land in Davie. And this piece of land used to have a house on it. It had been condemned, so the house is no longer there. The city had torn it down. And the deal actually ultimately fell through. There were tons of liens against the property. Uh, the title work was really messy. Uh, so it didn't work out, but it sort of got me thinking more about working in land. And the idea of working with land as opposed to houses not dealing with the inspections, uh, having less competition, all that good stuff sounded appealing. So I started exploring it a little bit more. And I think the first real introduction I got to it was actually on a Bigger Pockets podcast with Seth Williams, who does some land investing. And I continued to explore and I came across the Land Geek podcast, which you know, was awesome for me because it was a podcast completely dedicated to land investing. So I came across that in probably say mid, mid December of 2013. I listened to maybe 10 to 15 of the podcasts uh, while I was up in Ohio with my parents over Christmas. And that sort of convinced me that this was the direction I wanted to go in. I heard a couple of your other podcasts with new students and eventually decided to invest in the toolkit myself. Wow, okay, great. So when you first got the toolkit, what did you think of the program? 
I thought the program was great. Uh, I really liked how the toolkit it's split into you know different sections. Each section you know devoted to a major step in the entire deal flow cycle. So you know you've got your more deals than you can handle finding seller leads. You've got more buyers than you can handle finding the buyer leads. You've got the due diligence module. Uh, you've got the templates you use for your letters, all the paperwork, that stuff is really useful. So it sort of steps through from, you know, your very first day in land investing all the way through to closing your first deal and how to do it. So let me, let me you know, I, I sometimes get these, these home study courses and there are 20 DVDs. There's a huge book, a huge binder. And I look at it and I think, I, I, I. And uh, it's just overwhelming. Did you feel overwhelmed at all when you first kind of looked at this big package and all these modules and the booklet and thought, oi, 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 where do I start? Like, was there any of that? Was there any feeling of overwhelm or did you just kind of just dive into it? Yeah, I, I sort of just dived into it. I was really excited to get going. And I had a lot of time in my hands at that point because I was in Ohio for, I don't know, probably a week. And I've never actually lived in Ohio. My parents live there, but you know, that means I don't have much in the way of social distraction. So, uh, yeah, I just went right into it. I watched all the modules start to finish probably in, I don't know, three days. Okay, that's fast. Uh, and went through, reviewed all the paperwork, all the contracts you use, started exploring the resources that you mentioned in the toolkit, and sort of just went from there. Okay, great, great. So when did you, like, from when you first invested in the toolkit, how long did it take you to send out your first mailing? Your first, your first batch of offers? My first batch of offers probably went out say the first week of January. And I think, yeah, I think probably maybe 10 days or so after I got the toolkit, maybe two weeks, I'd send out my first letters. Right, right. You know, I think that's really uh, special because my experience is a lot of the new coaching students want to get all their ducks in a row first before they start making offers. So I'll get, I'll get emails, hey, should I set up an LLC, um, you know, before I start doing this, or, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Did you set up an LLC first? Did you have an LLC? Did you, were you worried about any of those sort of administrative issues before you started making offers? Yeah, I mean, I guess I was maybe at a little bit of an advantage because I'd moved down here to do the wholesaling business with my brother. He had some insight into how this all works and you know you do similar letter campaigns with that so we had done a couple of those he had helped me set up my llc for that and i'm just using the same llc for the land business so for me you know the course was really useful in learning how the deal process with the land business is different than the wholesaling right uh, but I knew sort of in terms of sending out the offers, that was you know what I had to do to get started. So that's what I did. Okay, great, great. Okay, so you sent out your first batch of offers in a county in which state? In Florida. Okay, so you're in your own backyard. Now, did, were you familiar with this county? How much due diligence did you do prior to your letter writing? Well, I was sort of familiar with it. I'd lived up, uh, near this county back when I uh, was an undergrad, uh, but I haven't been anywhere near there for the past six years or so. And in terms of due diligence, I actually, you know, I started off focusing in South Florida, but I got the feeling that it was really, really competitive and, you know, higher prices for the land down here. Uh, so I switched strategies. I started looking for counties that were less competitive, uh, had a lot of land, uh, so less densely populated counties. And 
I came up with a list of maybe 10 or 15, and then I just picked a couple at random from that list, started mailing letters, and this one particular county I got a pretty good response from, so I've been focusing on that one ever since. Great, great. And as far as scrubbing the list, was that difficult for you? Did you have any roadblocks with that? In well, that so actually the first, I'd say the first two or three mailings I did, I actually did. Or even did. getting the list, you know, what, what, what challenges did you have or did you face when you first started doing this? Okay, so my first few mailings, I was using lists of properties that were actually going to auction. So I was doing deed grabbing, essentially. So Florida is nice because a lot of counties uh, post that information online. It's pretty easy to access. So I get a list of these properties from the county websites that are going to auction. I know depending on the county, they'll post them anywhere from maybe three weeks to two or three months ahead of time. So I'd get these addresses. I'd locate the property owners, the addresses of the property owners, and I'd just send them a letter saying, hey, I see your property's going to auction. Uh, if that happens, you might lose it. So I'm here. I'm willing to give you a cash offer. I'll pay off the back taxes for you, and you'll get some cash for it. Nice. So I found that I was getting a great response from those, but the main issue that would come up was that they would have pretty high amounts of back taxes on them. Right, right. So I'd be getting some properties with, I don't know, maybe five, six thousand dollars of back taxes when the property itself would be worth maybe, I don't know, one or two thousand dollars. <laughs> so I was getting tons of leads, but relatively few of them really ended up being good deals. Uh, but I did actually get my first two good deals out of that because it was a seller who owned one property going to auction, but he also owned several other properties that weren't going to auction, but were still tax delinquent. So I managed to buy a couple of those from him rather than the one that was going to auction. Okay, great. Now, do you have numbers as far as what your response rate was? So I typically get about five to seven percent response rate on my mailings and get, you know, five to seven deals out of every hundred letters. Did you have a similar experience? Yeah, I'd say five to seven percent response rate on the uh, tax auction letters. Uh, sounds about right. Uh, and, you know, in terms of offers I actually followed up with, you know, I maybe two percent all the letters I was sending. Okay. Okay. That's, yeah, I mean, that's a little lower than average. And that might have just been either, you know, because Florida is more competitive or right. or just the, the county. I don't know. It's a little lower, but it's, look, it's still, it's still better than 0%, right? It is. And I mean, I'm sending a good number of letters out, so I'm, you know, it's not like I'm struggling to find good leads. Right. I'm, maybe it's just because I'm being more picky about some of the leads that I'm going after. Uh, you know, I've, I've sort of made it a goal to spend very little money on getting the deals. So I just don't have a ton of cash to be playing with right now. So I'll send out really low offers. And, you know, I've got a lot of nasty voicemails. <laughs> Which, you know, I think it's good. If you're not getting nasty voicemails, I think, you know, maybe you need to make your offers lower. <laughs> right. But on the other hand, you know, you got these voicemails and it can be, you know, I guess it can be a bit intimidating when you're getting started. But I think it's it's good practice to get them and then, you know, just keep on going or just rush them off. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's funny. Uh, within our, in our Gold Mastermind, I was on the, uh, the Facebook, uh, the, 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 the private Facebook community page, and, uh, and one of the students was like, I got, I got a nasty letter from 
the uh, the owner saying that what I was doing was illegal, and that they were going to call the district attorney, and she was really worried about it. I said, "No, you can send out a letter. Like they're not out anything. It, they were just kind of." annoyed that they got an offer on their property and you're saying they owe back taxes and they don't owe back taxes and they're all confused and they think it's a scam and you're trying to get their property and like no they're not really out of anything so uh yeah not illegal right i definitely had a couple of calls like that uh and initially i would follow up with them i'd be like hey sorry you know i according to the records your property was tax delinquent but you know, I don't know, maybe it isn't, but it's on that list for some reason. I think, you know, that happens mostly when I was using the list from Agent Pro, and those, I think, tend to be a little bit out of date. Right. So that could be why. But anyway, I mean, at this point, I still get those calls sometimes, and I just, you know, I just leave them. Sure. Not sure. too worried about it. So let me ask you, how many hours a week are you working on this business? I would say I'm working... Maybe 20 to 25 hours a week on land and then 10 to 15 on the wholesaling. Okay. So I mean, I'm doing this full time. Wow. Real estate investing that is. Okay. Okay. And so, um, well, you're putting more time into, uh, to land business than I am. Now, are you, are you doing everything yourself? Yeah. I don't have tons of VAs like you do. <laughs> Start working on the business, not in the business. Yeah, I'm I'm working towards that. Uh, you know, I do have a nice printer here that will do the yellow letters for me. Put yellow paper in, and it'll print the lines on it. And you know, I've got a font that replicates my handwriting, so that makes the yellow letters easy. Uh, and I actually use a closing company to do the closing on my deals. Uh, I'm actually affiliated with a brokerage down here, and they have a title company in-house. So they give me a, you know, slightly lower rate. Still not as low as if I was gonna do it myself. What are they charging you on average? Uh, you know, when all is said and done, you know, with the recording fees, stamp taxes, uh, the costs that the title company takes, lien searches, all that stuff, I'm probably looking between 1,000 and Fourteen hundred dollars. Okay, but you think you're going to get value out of that service? I am. I mean, certainly to begin with, when I'm not as comfortable doing all the title work myself, I think it's nice to know you're having a title company do it. They're going to give you title insurance. If they can't give you title insurance, then that's probably a property that you want to stay away from. Uh, at least in my opinion. Right. And I've also started setting up my deals where I will, you know, I know you like using options for yours. Uh, I've started sending out offers and I'll just put a 60 to 90 day closing period on them. And I'll have an addendum in the contract that says I can market the property as soon as that seller signs the agreement <clears throat> and my deposit will be fully refundable. So I'm getting the property under contract to buy it. I have permission to market it and I have a refundable deposit. So as soon as I get it under contract, I'll send it to the title company, tell them to hold on to it for a little bit while I market it. If I get a good sense that I'm gonna be able to sell the property, then I will tell them to proceed with the title work. And that way I can sort of tell before I put all the expense into the title work whether you know I'm going to be able to get a good deal out of it, so I'm not just wasting extra money on having the title company do it. Okay, great. I I, I like that approach. So you get your first, you do your first uh, set of offers. You get a bunch of agreements back. How long did it take you then to close using your title company and then start selling and then get your first <laughs> deal closed? Well, the two pieces that I have sold, uh, the title company, it took them probably about 45 days, and that's longer than usual. And the reason is because there was a typo in the paperwork for a previous mortgage holder 
on these pieces of land. Both these pieces of land were from the same seller. And before that seller had them, another person owned them, and that person had got a mortgage on the land. The mortgage was all paid off, but there was a typo in the paperwork that was recorded at the county to say this mortgage has been paid off. Sure. So the title company had to track that person down, have them sign off on the corrective paperwork uh, before they could get the title insurance and you know transfer the property with the warranty deed to me. So that all took about 45 days. Okay, so that's that's a little longer than usual. Right. Okay, so 45 days to close, then how long did it take for you to market it and then get your first buyer and then close with your buyer? Uh, with those ones, I actually had the buyers lined up before I closed on them. Well, so I started marketing them really as soon as I got them under contract. Uh, I mean, first I put up an ad on Craigslist looking for someone to go take photos of the properties for me. Sure. So I got those photos back in about a week. And as soon as I got that, I started just plastering Craigslist with ads for the property. Uh, I got a couple of buyers for each of them. I had them sign a uh, an agreement to purchase them, and I had a contingency in that agreement that said that the agreement was subject to me getting marketable title of that property. Uh, so then by the time that I closed on my end, I already had the sales agreement signed by my buyers. Phenomenal. So you really had almost no money out of pocket, correct? It was almost like an option because you were doing a dual close, correct? Uh, sort of. My closing company didn't do the closing on the on my sell side, so I just used them to do the closing and title work when I buy the property. And as soon as they do that, I know that the property is, you know, a clear title. So I'll just when I sell them, I'll close it myself using Notary Pro, like. You use sure. Uh, so I'll send a notary out there, uh, have the land contract signed and notarized, uh, and it's you know cheaper on the sell side for me, much cheaper. And I can send the buyer you know proof of the title insurance because I've just closed on it previously. Right. And did you get your money out on the down payment? Uh, I didn't. I'm a little bit behind, but I'll get it back within probably a year, year and a half. Year, year and a half, and how much will you make total on both deals? Total, I'll make, you know, over the length of the notes, both deals are seller financed. Uh, when both are paid off, I will make uh, just under 30000 I was actually thinking back about that testimonial I, re I uh, recorded for your website, and I was actually low on that estimate. I just went back and looked at the paperwork today, and I'll actually net 30000 on those. Okay, so you're going to net 30000 and At what interest rate are you financing at? I did 8% on these. I think I'm going to move higher next time. I've noticed that you know, at this point I've had calls from maybe 30 people who are looking for land in the area I'm working at. Okay. And they'll ask about the terms, you know, how the seller financing works. But I'd say maybe one of those 30 people has asked, what the interest rate is going to be? Yeah, they're all, they're always focused on the payment, not the rate. And I, yeah, exactly. I think uh, especially if you're not doing credit checks, it's just easy money. They should be paying a higher rate. Right. Yeah, especially if they're not putting that much down. Did they put six hundred down for you? On your yeah, six fifty down and seven hundred down. Okay, so six fifty down and seven hundred down. Okay. And what were these these properties like? Were they acreage? Were they lots? They were both uh, two acre lots. So two two acre lots. No, just raw land. Uh, there were you know mobile homes in the area, uh, so you know access to power would be pretty easy. You know there were power poles nearby. Uh, they were close to a lake. They weren't lakefront, but they, you know, were walking distance from the lake. Sure. So and, there's something compelling about the property. I love that. Right. Yeah, there's a good story there. Okay. Right. And 
Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at you know websites like Landwatch or other you know real estate websites, land in that area was selling significantly higher than I sold mine for. So I think that's what made it easy for me to sell them as quickly as I did. Right? Did you did you calculate your ROI? Um, is it, uh, it going to be over a thousand percent? I did calculate it. I don't have it in front of me. Uh, I don't know if I hit the thousand percent mark. Okay. But I, it was pretty high. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure. It's it's better it's better than a hundred percent. Yeah, and you know I had three hundred percent. It's been way better than three hundred percent. It's what we're gonna do on flips. I'd messed around with stocks previously for a few years when I was up in DC, and I don't know. I think I ended up. I don't know. I'm definitely no savvy investor when it comes to stocks, so I ended up maybe breaking even. But it was nice because I had you know a hundred bucks a week I'd just set aside to go into my brokerage account. So it helped me save, but I didn't really make anything off it. So now I'm three months into this and I'm gonna have a way better return over the long run. Yeah, and at the at the rate you're working it, I mean you're you're gonna start crushing it. Hopefully. Yeah, no, I know you are. If I'm not, I'm going to be in a tough spot a year from now. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what what would you say to a newbie, someone who's on the fence, maybe thinking about getting the investor's toolkit? Uh, what would you say is, you know, I don't know, what would you say? I would say go for it. Uh, it's not that big of an investment. It's... 997 bucks, I think. Yeah, I should raise the uh, price, I know. <laughs> now, you're not going to sell it if you say that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it's a thousand bucks. And I think one of the most valuable parts of it for me was getting the uh, paperwork and the forms that you use. Uh, I actually have a real estate license, so I have access to the standard Florida contracts. Sure. But, you know, they're really, you know, these are like 10 page documents, a lot of technical details in them that aren't really pertinent to land. Right. Uh, so the documents that you use, I mean, they're one, two page documents, really straightforward, yet, you know, pretty tight documents favorable to you. Uh, so it's nice to have that. Uh, so I mean, I'd say even just for that, the course is worth it. And then also, you know, the list of counties that you have, uh, some of the techniques for doing your research, finding lists, that's all really useful information. Okay, great, great. Um, anything you didn't like about the program? Was there anything that we thought, you know, be great to get approved here? Uh, you know, one thing, that, I, I don't know, I don't think this will bother everyone, but for me, so you have the list of counties that you supply, uh, which is awesome. But I found myself wondering, you know, if I wanted to pick a new county, what's a good technique for figuring out what is a promising county to target? So there was no real uh, explanation of how you pick those counties. Which I know now. I think they're from their counties that you or your students have done deals in. Uh, so I sort of spent some time wondering how to go about that, and I actually ended up pulling some census data and just looking at population trends in different counties in Florida to pick out a few additional counties. I figured maybe there'd be less competition if they weren't on that list. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's some insight into how you go about picking the counties would be useful. Okay, I will tell you right now, it is the secret county list are counties where I've done deals personally, my students have done deals, my competition has done deals. And this takes all the guesswork out of it because we know <laughs> deals can get done in these counties as opposed to other counties that, you know, we just don't know. We don't know the market. We can't pull up comps really easily and there's just more brain damage involved. Nothing wrong with it, and I like your strategy. Hey, I can go somewhere where I know there's gonna be less competition. I love that, 
I just, as especially when you're starting out, you want to have less anxiety as to where you're starting and and more of a sort of a, a secure base that you know deals can be done here because all these other people have done deals here. Sure. And, you know, that's probably a fault on my part a little bit, too. I find myself doing this with the wholesaling also. Once you get started, you get so excited and you want to experiment with all different things and you're like, oh, what if I, you know, try this kind of letter or what if I try this kind of that someone else hasn't tried? Right. Or, uh, you know, just little things you can do to tweak your business model. Uh, but I've really started focusing uh, more on a particular county, you know, doing the same strategy over and over again, trying to really figure out what works and just replicating it rather than you know, trying to go all over the place and try new and exciting things. Right, right. All right, great. Well, we have come to that point in the podcast where I get to put you on the spot and ask you for your tip of the week. Okay, so I do have a tip of the week. I've listened to the podcast enough to know that this always comes up, so I was prepared. So my tip is a book that I read when I was getting started. And it is called How to Be a Dirt Smart Buyer of Country Property. And it is by a guy named Curtis Seltzer. Sure. I, in fact, I want to get Curtis on the podcast. I know Curtis. Ah, okay, great. He's great. That's a great tip. So this book, it doesn't really – he's not the kind of guy that does the same thing as we're doing, I don't think. Uh, he doesn't. Right. So he talks a lot about – you know, it's more if you're a person who wants to purchase the ideal piece of farmland or hunting land, uh, you know, what you need to do to find that perfect piece of land. And he goes into a lot of detail about all the due diligence resources. And, you know, he'll have entire chapters just about surveys. I think he actually has two chapters on surveys. Uh, and yeah, I mean, some of the stuff was just really useful for me. Uh, one thing I remember in particular is that he has a section where he talks about uh, getting power to raw land, which, you know, starting this, I had no idea how that worked. If someone, if one of my buyers had called me and asked, you know, what's the situation? How do I get power out here? How much is it going to cost? I wouldn't have been able to answer the question. And at least now I know that Usually power either goes over land, under land. Some counties will let you pay it off in installments, monthly payments. Uh, and I don't know, that stuff to me now is pretty obvious, but getting started wasn't. And so he, that book contains a lot of that kind of information. Yeah, that's great. I, I've got to get him on the podcast. We talked about it uh, a while ago. And I, I know he's busy and I got busy and I thought I just kind of forgot about it. But yeah, that's a great, great tip. So my tip of the week is going to be a simple organizational tip. I don't know if I've talked about this in the past, but if you want to go paperless, it's this today is the easiest time ever. And Jonathan, you know, in this business, there's a ton of paper, but with a scanner and Dropbox, you can really go paperless. So Dropbox is phenomenal in the sense that it is all your stuff in the cloud and on all your devices. So on your cell phone, on your laptop, on your main computer, anywhere you are in the world, you can have access to your files, which especially for our business where we can do this from anywhere in the world as long as we have an internet connection and have access to your files. And my Dropbox folder is great. And I also use it for, uh, a backup as well because it's in the cloud. Now, I wouldn't just have that as my sole backup. You want to have, you know, definitely other backups there. But if you have, if you're not using Dropbox, check it out, and uh, I'll have a link to it as well. So, Jonathan, how do you feel about this podcast? Your first time podcasting. I feel great, and you know, if you don't mind, can I just add one more thing to your Dropbox tip? Sure. I've been using this thing called Genius Scan, and it's an app for your iPhone. It lets you just take photos of any documents you get, and it generates a PDF from it, and it will actually sync up to your Dropbox. Genius scan. 
Yeah, so with those two powers combined, you know, there's really no stopping you. I love it. What about Evernote? You know, like Evernote? Evernote I haven't used. Use Yeah, Evernote will do the same thing. Uh, I love Evernote. That's a whole... Wait, I, forget that I even said Evernote. I want to use that for a tip next week. Okay. <laughs> Ignore what I just said. So, uh, anything else you want to you want to close with? I, so I do want to congratulate you on uh, completing the 180 day success challenge, getting your investment back on the investors toolkit within only 90 days, which is half the time. And uh, you know, I'm I'm so glad that you're part of the Lanky community. You're doing so well, and uh, I'm very proud. I'm very proud. Well, thanks, Mark. It's uh, been a great experience so far, and you know, I definitely recommend anyone who's out there on the fence considering whether this is a good investment. You know, it definitely is, and you can get it back. You know, if you fulfill the 180-day success challenge, then you're not going to be out of pocket. Right, and if you're asking, well, how's Mark going to make any money doing this? Um, I'm not. So <laughs> at some point, I will have to stop it. But I do want to have this overwhelming amount of uh, video testimonials where I can show other people, hey, this is not pie in the sky, late night infomercial hype. This is a real viable business that you can be successful at. And here's the proof. Jonathan Kennedy is the proof. And uh, yeah. So yeah. If I can do it, you guys can do it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, although I would say that Jonathan did have a little bit of an advantage, the fact that he had his LLC already started and some experience with wholesaling with his brother, but he still didn't know anything about land, right? Right. Nothing. Nothing. So, uh, yeah, I'll leave you off on that. Anyways, if you guys want to learn more tips, tricks, techniques on how to make an incredible income, like Jonathan Kennedy, actively or passively, go to www.thelanegeek.com and download the Passive Income Blueprint. Get the ebook, How to Avoid Three Fatal Land Buying Mistakes. And of course, get this always fun and informative podcast delivered each week to your email inbox. And of course, give me some love. If you want to acquire some wholesale land, go to FrontierPropertiesUSA.com. We can hook you up. Uh, I don't think, Jonathan, do you have a website yet? I do, but I'm not going to share it just yet because it's sort of a work in progress. Okay. Well, not a problem. You can always get in touch with uh, my Lane Geek team and if you want to get in touch with Jonathan, get more details from him about the Investor's Toolkit and his experience, I'm sure he'll be happy to share it with you. Sure, yeah. I mean, feel free to send me an email or whatever. All right. Jonathan, thanks so much. This is Mark Podolsky, the Lane Geek. And uh, I'll see everybody next week. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Land Geek. Join us next time for more tips, secrets, and information that will help you succeed. Stay connected with The Land Geek on Facebook at facebook.com slash thelandgeek.